Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, Hawaii 808. Um, what's the name of this show anyway, Marco? En Energy 808, the cutting edge. 808, yes. <laughs> and that's Marco Mangelsdorf. He joins us by phone from Maui, and he's at the, um, uh, the, Ho uh, the Hawaii Energy Conference in Maui. It used to be called the, Hawaii, the Maui Energy Conference in Maui. Now it's the Hawaii Energy Conference in Maui. Can you explain that to me, Marco? I'd be happy to. It's, uh, it's great to be your, your faithful correspondent here on the move, so to speak. So, yeah, there is uh, what used to be known as the Energy, uh, Maui Energy Conference over the past year put on by our friends at the Maui Economic Development Board in Kihei, also known as MEDB. And they have been the organizers and lined up sponsors to do these conferences over the years that uh, heretofore used to be the Maui Energy Conference. Well, now that uh, this company on the mainland called uh, Verge, which was a uh, conference organizer of, uh, of repute that had done a number of conferences, energy conferences on Oahu, they decided last year that they were done. So no more so-called Verge conferences in the heart of beautiful downtown Waikiki. So that left an opening for MEDB to put on an energy conference that, rather than calling it the Maui Energy Conference, they thought this is a good time to kind of uh, reintroduce the brand name of the Hawaii Energy Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, now that there's no other mainland group that's coming in uh, with great fanfare and trying to put on a, a profitable show, because they're not going to do it unless they make money, of course. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it served as a great opportunity for MEDB to rebrand as the Hawaii Energy Conference. And, you know, so much of this is, yes, it's substance, but it's also what I call the C and B scene. Uh, so it's interesting to, sh to see who shows up. Are they the, the A players, the B players, or somewhere? Kathy Griffin like the D list. And I can tell you that uh, so far, this seems like uh, a list of at attendees. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's only been less than a full day, and I'm taking a little bit of break before I go back after our show. But, uh, yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, they're putting on a great show. The Mac's a beautiful place to, uh, to have a conference and uh, a lot of uh, networking going on. So it's, uh, it's great to be a part of it. Yeah, that's great. Well, it just shows you the, you know, the relationship of the islands. Uh, you know, each island has its own identity. And the neighbor islands, they, they sort of form a group in, this, in a way. Um, it's like um, Oahu is in one side of the camp and all the neighbor islands are on the other side. And, this is a, an example of that. For myself, as I told you before the show, you know, I really wish there was a, a more inexpensive way for people to get from island to island. Um, who knows, maybe Southwest uh, Airlines will help us do that. Um, but the Super Ferry would have done a great job if we allowed it to, uh, to, to prosper. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all the legal action brought it down, and that was the end of that. But the, the, uh, the neighbor islands need connection with Oahu. We, we, all of the islands, need connection with each other. Uh, and somehow that, that, that issue is, is present when you see a, um, a statewide conference being held on one of the neighbor islands, um, wrested away from Oahu somehow. <laughs> so uh, there was, a, there was a, a discussion about this point by Mayor Victorino, the father of baseball, as it were. Uh, he was yeah. talking about the neighbor islands and the outer islands, and what what was the discussion there? Uh, it, yeah, he's uh, Michael Victorino is the uh, the mayor of the county of Maui, including Maui, of course, proper Molokai and Lanai, and uh, very affable, big, uh, big kind of bearish uh, of a guy, you know, just very super friendly, and uh, he kind of gave the opening address this morning and uh, told a couple of kind of interesting anecdotal stories in terms of. Uh, now, why why is Hawaii called Hawaii instead of let's say Maui or Kauai or one of the other islands? And uh, and it, it makes perfect sense now that you told the story, Jay. But I hadn't heard this story before, which is that King Kamehameha the first was the of course uh, the uniter of all the islands, and he then chose uh, his domain, so to speak, to be called the uh, uh, the Kingdom of Hawaii with uh, with with him as the first king, of course. And that then it became the the territory of Hawaii, then the state of Hawaii, if I have my my sequence straight. 
And if he had, for example, come from Maui, we would now be known as the state of Maui because that's where, where the, the, the uniter of the islands will have come from. And that's one kind of interesting anecdote from, uh, from uh, Mr. Victorino, which I enjoyed. Uh, another one uh, that I also enjoyed is uh, that he shared that he, he always takes a little bit of umbrage and a bit irritated when uh, people typically on Oahu refer to uh, the other islands as, quote, the outer outer islands as opposed to the more neighborly sound of the neighbor islands. And he said, I, you know, there's nothing outer at all about being here, born and, and bred and raised on, on Maui. Uh, so it, it just kind of goes to this, uh, oh, what shall I call it, a little bit of an inferiority complex or maybe chip on our shoulder of those of us who live uh, in the state other than Oahu. I mean, I've, I've come to believe in the 20 some odd years I've lived here full time and the uh, well over 50 years I've been a part of Hawaii is uh, that this place is rather Oahu centric, uh, both uh, in terms of the political center of gravity, uh, the economy, and, and the media. So I'm, I'm again really thrilled that the folks at MEDB have been able to put, a, put up a world class conference here and, and attract A list people. So. Uh, um, but that's great to see because I think there's a heck of a lot going on 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 islands other than Oahu uh, that uh, are worth looking at, emulating, and learning from. Yeah, uh, it is really a feather in Maui's cap that Cannon does this. Um, and Jeannie Scog, I think she retired, but she was the the founder of the conference, as I recall. You must see her around there at the conference. I'm sure she would be involved. Yeah, Jeannie's uh, is here. Leslie Wilkins took over for her and has been. Uh, yes. I've, uh, I've certainly talked to her today, and she's been very much involved. So, uh, Jeannie, and I knew Jeannie as well. Uh, so, it's great to see this continuity of, uh, of this organization doing great things. And, yeah. kind of a uh, little sidebar note I was, uh, my company uh, put up one of the early commercial photovoltaic systems on the island. Uh, gosh, you know, way back 11 years ago, way before it, it really took off in terms of PV adoption. And one of our first projects was, lo and behold, right on the roof of MEDB there uh, off of Lipoa. Oh, no Parkway kidding. In Ihe. <laughs> I so know I that building. There. I know that building. I know you where know it that went building. <laughs> so I was up there yesterday doing uh, the annual inspection uh, uh, for the system. And I can tell you, after 11 years in the hot Kihei sun, despite getting... Uh, Pooped on big time by by flocks of passing birds that seem to take a liking to to uh, <laughs> perching themselves on top of solar modules. Other than that, uh, the system is working after eleven years. That's great. That's great. Well, it's a beautiful building, as I recall. It was really well designed, well executed, and uh, of course, it was energy. It, it was be- it was built around uh, clean energy. So, what, what, tell me about some of the things that are happening in the conference. Um, aside from the, you know, the, uh, the A-list people there, uh, what about the program itself? What about the speakers? What about the subjects? Uh, a couple things, few things come to mind. Uh, there was a, a joint announcement between our PUC chair, Dr. James Griffin, also known as Jay Griffin, and the PUC chair of the California CP or PUC, uh, whose name is Michael Picker, P-I-C-K-E-L, P-I-C-K-E-R, Michael Picker. And they announced uh, this morning that they had come to a, a memorandum of understanding or, or move for short uh, that uh, California and Hawaii Public Utilities Commissions were going to increase their cooperation and collaboration in terms of uh, uh, moving forward far, further, faster, deeper, as I put it, as far as uh, bringing renew- cost-effective renewable energy online as soon as possible. So there's a, a definite partnership synergy between, between ourselves and our neighbors to the east there, California. Uh, so I think that's, that's really, you know, you could say, well, that's just largely symbolic and, you know, kind of fluff. But I, I think it's, it's more than that. I think California and Hawaii uh, share so much. I mean, the single place in the, on the planet sends more people to Hawaii than any other places, of course, our neighbors to the east, the great state of California. I'm a, I'm a native Californian as well. Mm-hmm. And there's also a commitment in, uh, on the part of uh, uh, the Democratic governors uh, of 
formerly uh, Governor Jerry Brown, who was there for eight years up until um, last year, and uh, Governor David Ige on our side, and now Governor David, um, sorry, um, Gavin Newsom in California, that uh, these are two states that both from the executive to the legislative branch to the, the regulatory bodies have made really firm, solid, uh, and aggressive commitments towards uh, dramatically increasing the deployment of cost-effective renewables, not just in power generation, but to EV transportation. So there's a lot I think California can learn from us and a lot we can learn from California. I think it's just great. So what, what does this agreement mean, things. Marco? I mean, does it, does it bespeak of um, collaboration? How? Uh, they get on the phone, they have meetings, they come to the other guy's uh, PUC hearing room. Uh, what, is, what does it portend? Well, I, I haven't actually read the MOU, Jay. I, I, I saw it from backstage because uh, I, was, I was helping out backstage. Uh, but I haven't actually read it, so I can't comment on the actual substance. But uh, I got to believe that it's more than just fluff because, uh, you know, people like Jay Griffin and Michael Picker and their respective commissions, the commission staff, aren't, in it, aren't into it for signing ceremonies, but, you know, it's got to be something substantive. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I can't give you specifics yet because I haven't read the actual document, but uh, i got to believe it's more than fluff and, and more like uh, filet mignon or, or, or scallops uh, just cooked <laughs> right. We'll have to follow up, see, what, see how it works out. Now, you said that Jennifer Potter was also there. What did she speak about? Yeah, this afternoon, uh, before I came back uh, to my room, uh, Jennifer Potter, a.k.a. Jenny, she was on stage with uh, a number of interesting people, including uh, Michael Picker, the president of the California PUC, uh, the governor. Uh, our governor, David Ige, was there speaking about his and, and our commitment, uh, the state's commitment from the executive on down to, uh, to renewables. And then there was a woman by the name of Abigail Anthony, who is a commissioner from the Rhode Island Public Utilities Commission. And one of the subjects uh, that was discussed during this panel was uh, public uh, benefits regulation, PBR, not to be confused with PB&J, PBR for short, which is a, uh, to the uninitiated, is kind of daunting in terms of well, what in the world is PBR. Well, mm. PBR would effectively uh, change what has been the traditional decades-long uh, business model of an investor-owned utility, which is essentially has been cost of sales plus. And what that means is that utilities uh, get permission to spend money, they find the money to spend, and they're guaranteed a certain return on equity uh, that the commission decides on. So, you know, the slam has been against that model is that utilities are incentivized to spend more money because the more money they spend, the more they're going to get back uh, uh, as a return. And uh, the public benefits regulation turns that model on its head, in my opinion, and, and, and essentially establishes a new business model for an investor on utility like Hawaiian Electric that would set out specific metrics and incentives that would be in the public benefit for the utility to reach. And depending on how well they reach and achieve those goals and, and hit those, those metrics, they will be rewarded accordingly. With the flip side being, if they don't hit the agreed upon metrics, then they won't be rewarded accordingly. So it is... Uh, it is essentially rewarding, uh, in this case, an investor in utility, uh, rewarding them to do well and disincentivizing them to do poorly. Mm -hmm. So the well, could you, process could you, right now, yeah. Could you get a handle on, um, you know, the kinds of metrics that would go into this? Could you get a handle on how firm they were? I mean, I, I, it's been a while um, since this first came up, six months anyway, and right. um, I wonder how far along the track we are and whether we, we are seeing the outlines of what it will look like uh, being developed here. What does it look like from the point of view of this conference? Oh, great question. And, and I was just going to get there, which is that, uh, you know, a little bit of background. Uh, as far as I know, 
no state in the United States has fully implemented a PBR model. So this is really terra incognita, uh, or if we want to be on land or you know, an unexplored ocean if we want to stay on the water, in that it hasn't actually happened yet in the U.S., full-blown PBR. Mm-hmm. So there is a docket that's, like you referred to, that's been open uh, for, gosh, uh, uh, more than a year, I think, uh, to, for the commission and various parties, approximately 11 parties, to look at, at uh, public benefits uh, regulation. And they established, the commission established phase one and phase two. Phase one was discovery, where the uh, the participants and the commission were kind of you know making it a bit of a free for all in terms of okay bring us everything you've got, and phase two is going to be a significant winnowing down. Uh, Jenny Potter stated an hour or two ago that they started off with essentially 24 options, 24 directions to go in. This is uh, at the end of phase one. Mm-hmm and that they winnowed that down further to 12. So they're in a winnowing process, taking this immense amount of creative energy, data, ideas, paths to go down, and winnowing, winnowing them down from 24 to 12 to, you know, what's next, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1, and so mm-hmm, forth. Mm-hmm. So the progress is definitely being made. You know, it, it's a complex docket. It's a complex subject matter, and I have not been keeping up breathlessly day-to-day looking at the PUC's uh, data management service website saying, oh, what has been uploaded today? Gee, another 200 pages for me to read. I, I have not been that hardcore. Uh, so you know, it, it, it's great to get Jenny's kind of highbrow, uh, high-altitude look, and, but she seems very excited, and she seems... Uh, both she and Jay Griffin, I think, uh, I have no doubt, understand the importance, the, the, the critical importance of getting this right, because you're dealing with one of the most important corporations and companies in the state of Hawaii, Hawaiian Electric, that has been around since the days of King David Kalakaua in the 1890s. And these folks uh, provide something critical in terms of instru- infrastructure to uh, the vast majority of people in the state. And if you're going to be changing the business model from the ground up for a company like that, you better darn sure, make darn sure that you, you're doing it in a very judicious, thoughtful fashion. And I, I think that's exactly what's, what's taking place. Well, you know, it strikes me that when you're on, um, you know, you're, you're having an experiment, it's new ground nobody's been on before, then you can expect, um, you know, that first efforts may not work as well as you want. And, and the stakes are high because if, if you make it too hard for the utility, um, you know, that has one profound result. If you make it too easy for the utility, that has another profound result. And so, uh, you know, it seems to me that whatever the commission decides and however the community reacts to it and however the utility reacts to it, there's, there's going to have to be multiple iterations of fine-tuning going forward before this uh, settles down. And I suspect we will all know much more about it before it settles down because there will be maybe some arguments about exactly what's fair and not fair, what works, it doesn't work. I don't know if there's any discussion about that, but it seems to me that this is, this is an experiment uh, that will go through um, multiple you know, re- reconsiderations. Yeah, absolutely. And one kind of sidebar note to that, uh, Jay, which I find just really fascinating and rather puzzling is, you know, I, I've been public uh, in one or more places that uh, both PBR and another pending docket or the, called the Affiliated Transaction Docket uh, regarding Hawaiian Electric, that those two dockets have the potential to, uh, to kind of shake things up at a fairly deep level, uh, how that company does business and that, you know, how, how is the investor class looking at HEI, which is traded on the New York Stock Exchange, with this background of uncertainty, for, in my opinion, uh, and with these various kind of critical dockets. And lo and behold, uh, I don't know if you've been following HEI stock price at all, but uh, Hawaiian Electric has been trading over 40 bucks a share over the past week, and they've been even going as high as 41, and, and this is record high for them. I mean, they've never, they've never hit 40. In fact, during the 
the, the proposed acquisition from next year, I think the buyout uh, of uh, next year of purchasing HEI stock was somewhere, if I'm not mistaken, in the 37 range, which was the premium on top of what the shares were trading at, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So what in the world accounts for Hawaiian Electric trading at record highs right now when if you look at their financial performance, I mean, there's nothing, they're not doing necessarily poorly, but they're not doing fantastically well uh, that would necessarily reflect a record high stock price. So, you know, we, we get, get into a very interesting discussion, I guess, about the, uh, you know, uh, animal spirits, uh, like um, John Maynard Keynes would describe uh, how stock markets and the markets work sometimes, but rather interesting, you know, at least in the real world and all this background talk of, What's going to happen with PBR? What's going to happen, happen with affiliated transactions? What's going to happen uh, on, on grid modernization? All these important things for Hawaiian Electric. And yet, at least as far as the market is concerned, the stock price keeps on going up, up, up. So go figure. Well, I, I, I a thought on that. Of course, uh, CBR is, uh, you know, it's an unknown right now. And it, it could be a bad time. could be a very good time. But, it's, you know, you don't know yet. Um, at the same time, it seems to me, and we're going to have a show about this on our, on our Hawaii State of Clean Energy series, which begins at 4 o'clock today with Peter Rossick, the spokesman for uh, Hawaiian Electric, about various um, positive things that have been happening. Approvals by the PUC of, of their bus rate and, and their utility-scale solar. Um, and uh, they, they got an award recently um, on their uh, crisis management communications. So, I mean, they're, they're out there, and they seem to get positive press and positive results. And if I were an investor in Wall Street, you know, I, 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 like, I like certainty, and I don't like uncertainty, but I, I like to see a given company um, do well, do well in the eyes of the regulators and do well in the eyes of the public. And I think, I think they're probably doing well. And that may be one factor, but who knows if that's the real answer or just um, you know one 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 among many elements. In any well, event, I hope you get a chance. Please ask my friend Peter Rosseg, looking him in the eye and say, Peter, what's going on with the with the stock of your company? What accounts for you being <laughs> you guys being in rarefied territory? And see what Mr. Rosseg Rosseg says. <laughs> yeah, you, I hope you listen to the show, Marco. It's on right away. <laughs> I would never miss you, my friend. <laughs> so tell me more. I mean, what, you know, what about um, you know, the old traditional classical issues for discussions at conferences like this? You know, new technology, new solar, new inverters, uh, new grid equipment, um, new, new fasteners to be more resilient in the case of storms and the like. Um, you know, new technologies to, to develop uh, renewable energy. What, what's, what's the conversation, and is that... Is that a major part of, of this uh, conference? Yes, it is. I mean, uh, there's been a fair, there were a number of sessions on uh, distributed energy resources, uh, a DER or DER for short, which, uh, you know, over time there's this kind of uh, evolution of, of various techno babble phrases. It was distributed generation at one point before it was DER, and then before that it was rooftop solar. And before that, it was, uh, you know, knives and bearskins. Now, I'm kind of making that up, but it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of a challenge sometimes to keep up with the, uh, the jargon, as I guess it is in any industry. And there is a commitment, I think, on all parties, including um, uh, a uh, really sharp uh, contributor from, uh, from HECO, Elise, uh, who was on one of the panels this morning, uh, and she reiterated that Hawaiian Electric is firmly committed to uh, a significant increase in rooftop solar. And that's not the first time I've heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, well, how, how do you make that happen? And net energy metering is gone. It's, it ain't never going to come back in terms of retail credit for power fed into the grid. And the existing interconnect agreements, uh, which, again, have a bunch of kind of alphabet soup gobbledygook names to them, uh, they're also a relatively interim. So there's a, a big effort on the part of Hawaiian Electric uh, and the Commission to come up with programs that will uh, allow consumers some degree of predictability and, and confidence that uh, won't go away necessarily once a certain cap is reached in six months 
or in 12 months or mm -hmm. 14 months. So what comes next for distributed energy resources, uh, a.k.a. rooftop solar and, and storage? How do we integrate, uh, essentially, how do we build this, this new grid, this smart grid, that is a, a radical departure from the Edisonian uh, large central power plants uh, as, and transmitting and distributing energy, you know, thousands of miles away, and at least in the case of the mainland, which has been the, 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 the backbone of utility planning up until recently, over 100 years. Where do we go? How do we get there as far as integrating energy generation on a rooftop by rooftop by rooftop by rooftop level so that it's not just I'm supplying power for me as I do for my NEM system in Hilo, but is there a way for my system and my battery, my Tesla battery, to hook up with my neighbor's system and his fill-in-the-blank battery and his neighbor's system and his fill-in-the-blank battery so that there can be the beginning of, of kind of a nascent microgrid that would be ultimately much more resilient, reliable, durable, and able to absorb um, hits to the system from a hurricane, for example. So that's, you know, we all, I think, agree that that's where we are going. That's where we need to go. That's you know, it, it strikes me that, go. Th that, you know, you mentioned before there's a certain amount of networking going on, and it strikes me that uh, a conference like this, and good that it's uh, statewide or beyond that, um, is very valuable for the networking, and the networking is very valuable to come together on these various, um, you know, siloed, uh, otherwise siloed technologies, and come up with solutions that, you know, where people are cooperating across across the aisle. Um, and it, we we really need to think together on a project so complex as, uh, you know, uh, green energy for the state. Uh, so I think a conference like this is very valuable, and everything you hear there. Everything you you know schmooze about is is uh, is important because it may lead to solutions. Um, call it social. It's like they say, real estate is not about real estate is not about land. It's about relationships. Well, yes. So is energy. It's not about energy. It's about relationships. And uh, the more deals that can be made, the more you know common solutions can be achieved. And so this, that's why a conference like this is so important. So, question: What are you hearing about? What kind of reaction in the hallways and passageways at the back of the conference rooms? What are you hearing about the legislature's failure to adopt the, uh, uh, the bill that's been proposed now for three years for the solar tax credits and uh, wrapping around storage? That, that sad subject has not come up. Uh, we don't, we'll have Chris Lee, uh, House Rep Chris Lee, uh, who was the longtime chair of the uh, our house energy and environment committee after mina uh left to become um buc chair you might remember and chris m m moseyed on over to the judiciary committee this session uh so i'm not sure why he's coming back in an energy capacity but i guess maybe he just misses us all but chris <laughs> is going to be <laughs> chris will be on a on a panel tomorrow and i haven't run into him yet but i can guarantee you that uh uh, if I if I have some one-on-one -on -one time with Chris, I'm definitely going to get his take on it because I am um, I'm more than just kind of uh, disappointed in our legislature uh, at this point in terms of not not able to recognize the critical any any you note. Know, I'm not really into hyperbole. I'm, that's not really moi. Uh, so when I say critical, it's it's something I give given some critical consideration to the critical need the state has to dramatically, exponentially increase the deployment of energy storage all across the grid. Yeah. And I believe that a separate state tax credit to incentivize battery storage is well worth it in terms of the hit on the state's general fund. But uh, there doesn't seem to be any movement that I can tell in our legislature this particular session to do that, whereas the last three sessions at least had made a bill that included energy storage tax credit made it through to the conference committee. I don't think that's going to happen this year. Instead, a bill is going to be considered, Senate Bill 1163 is now in the House, that would ramp down the state's renewable energy investment tax credit 
And uh, this will be on top of, if it were to get to the governor's desk, I don't know if he's signing it, uh, on top of the ramp down of the federal investment tax credit, which starts January 1st of this year. So, you know, the macro question is, is now a good time, reasonable time to start disincentivizing or lowering, lowering the incentives, both on the federal and the state side, for the deployment of cost-effective renewable oh, you want the sh You want the short answer? No, that's not, not a good time. You know, it amazes me that the state makes statements, uh, you know, about it, its direction. And it, it sets goals and targets and the like, and then it does nothing to actually move the needle ahead. It does nothing to incentivize. In fact, it withdraws previous incentives, uh, which is a disincentive. You know, people, the reality is industry and the and people in general uh, seek and need state leadership. And when they don't get state leadership, they're left to their own devices, and you can't move ahead on initiatives. You can't pronounce things and have them happen. You actually have to follow through. And it's really sad that uh, the state is in a situation where it made, it made pronouncements and now it's not following through. Will we reach those targets? Well, we're going to be super optimistic and say, oh, yeah, sure. But I don't think so. I don't think if we don't follow through, we're not going to reach those targets. And then looking back down the road, it's going to all seem very silly. So now's the time, not later. Now's the time for that. It's also a time uh, to, um, you know, to motivate people to buy electric cars, which we're not doing. Uh, so all in all, I mean, I hope this is discussed in that conference, and I hope, I hope there's some, you know, some, um, some statements made that will motivate government to take a, a leadership role. It's not enough that the governor shows up. He's got to actually do stuff, and he's got the energy office under him. He's got DBED under him. Uh, he can, and, he, and he could make uh, suggestions to the legislature and push on certain bills. He could. Uh, I don't know if that's being discussed, but that's my view. What's your view? Well, I mean, keep in mind that uh, no shortage of his own party members in the House and the Senate were very much hoping and banking on one Colleen Hanabusa to be Governor Hanabusa instead of Governor David Ige having a second term. So, you know, I, I'm not a tea leaf reader. I don't prowl the halls of the Capitol building getting all the scuttlebutt I can. But uh, I don't know to what extent Governor Ige has a whole lot of sway with his former colleagues. And, you know, my, my take, and again, this is very, very tentative from one of the neighbor islands. Uh, my take is that this particular legislative session there seems to be a greater skittishness uh, on the part of especially the money committees, the finance committee on the House side and the Ways and Means Committee on the Senate side. There seems to be a greater uh, nervousness about hits on the general fund uh, and a concern that we can't afford $10 million, $20 million, $30 million, for example. And those, those are kind of out of the air, but they're not completely out of left field as far as additional hit on the general fund uh, to support a, a, renew, a, a storage tax credit only. So I don't think it's just uh, regarding energy issues, but you know this whole kind of semi-fiasco about cutting 140 some odd positions at UH, which caused the folks at UH Hilo, UH Manoa, and elsewhere in the system to kind of you know, start wringing their hands and almost crying, crying in their simen, uh, that this was going to be devastating, and then somehow, you know, the the legislature backed off of this. But that's just my impression, Jay. I'd be interested in hearing your take as to is there a greater kind of concern right now in this particular legislative session about the state's finances and that we can't afford to do this, we can't afford to do that? Well, it's a zero-based budgeting concept that Sylvia Luke has put into play, and it means you have to justify every every penny, and you can't assume you're going to get uh, what you got before. You're going to have to uh, start from zero base. Uh, anyway, I want to ask you, uh, are you, are you involved in any of the panels, Marco? Uh, no, I wasn't on the panels uh, per se, but I, uh, Ed Fenster, who's one of the founders of a company called Sunrun, uh, they started in 2007 in the San Francisco Bay Area, so they've been mm -hmm. around for about 12 years. And Sunrun is the uh, biggest provider of residential third-party-owned photovoltaic systems across the U.S. They used to be a strong number two, while Tesla slash Solar City was number one. But Solar City, Tesla, uh, their their activity in the solar 
uh, TV realm has, has decreased dramatically over the past several years. So mm. Sunrun is the biggest in the country. They're the biggest player in Hawaii as well. So Ed Fenster gave the keynote this morning uh, to start things off, and the MEDB folks were kind enough to ask me to be Ed's interlocutor, a.k.a. question poser. So I had 15 minutes with Ed on the stage posing questions to him, which, uh, which, was, uh, which was great. So yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that's, that's the, the limit of my participation. So the, the, the conference goes again uh, tomorrow? And um, uh, will it be a, a whole additional day or part of a day tomorrow? Correct. Correct. Yeah, there are a bunch of interesting panels tomorrow, including uh, uh, folks from the utility company, uh, our friend Colton Ching, senior VP uh, at Hawaiian Electric, and uh, uh, a number of other uh, notable people from the A-list. So, yeah, it's, it's a good group, and uh, they serve really good food. So, hey, you know, no complaints. Yeah. One last question before we run. Marco, you know, uh, talk about the, uh, the Big Island. Uh, I, I guess you can still call it the Big Island instead of Hawaii Island. Pardon me for doing that. Um, you know, it has this huge, big, tall issue about geothermal. Has there any, any, been any discussion about geothermal and PGV? Uh, not so far. That said, I ran into our friend Mike Calacchini. Uh Mike is the um, kind of on-the-ground manager uh, had dude there for Puna Geothermal Venture, and uh, you know I have a very cordial relationship with Mike. And uh, uh, the last thing I heard about PGV uh, that was announced last week at a community forum meeting in Pahoa is that uh, they're spending some of their money to uh, give road access across the lava to dozens of homeowners who have been essentially left. Uh, uh, stranded in terms of being able to drive to their places uh, uh, that have been cut up by lava flow. So that, that doesn't really have much to do necessarily with PGV coming back online. But uh, I think there's still, how, how do I want to put this, there's still a lot of writing and many chapters left in the to be written in the saga of Putin Geothermal Venture coming back online or not coming back online. Well, it, and, and that goes to the larger picture. The many chapters uh, left to be written in the development of uh, clean, green energy in Hawaii in general, and you and I will cover them one by one, Marco. So I really appreciate your reporting in from the conference, and I hope you have a good time on your sojourn in Maui, and, and I look you. forward to talking to you next time uh, a couple of weeks from now. Well, we make quite the team, Jay. You there anchoring the studio in uh, the world headquarters of Think Tech Hawaii, uh, in the gathering place of, uh, of beautiful Oahu and Honolulu, and me, your faithful correspondent, out and about amongst the very friendly neighboring islands. <laughs> I couldn't have put it better myself, Marco. Thanks so much. You take care. You rock, my friend. Thank you. Aloha.